Sukui Garnervod. I am Tad Larkin, the lore master of Mandalore. And today, I'll be digging through the archives to bring you organizational data and the history of the Grand Army of the Republic. When one thinks of the Clone Wars, nothing has captivated the minds of galactic citizens more than the bravery, resilience, and infamy of the clone soldiers that fought within the ranks of the Grand Army of the Republic. However, this army that was seemingly put together overnight and mobilized within hours of the declaration of its creation has raised questions over the years. Just where did this army come from? How many clones were in it? And just how was it organized? The origins of the Grand Army are complex, and can be traced back to the end of the New Sith Wars, about 978 Galactic Standard years before the outbreak of the Clone Wars, where, at the Seventh Battle of Rusan, the Brotherhood of Darkness under Lord Khan was destroyed by a Thought Bomb, conjured by Lord Bane to bring about its destruction. After the battle, the then-crumbling Republic instituted the Rusan Reformations, which restructured the Republic and introduced such reforms as the incorporation of the Jedi Order into the judicial branch of government, as well as the dissolving of the Republic's standing army and navy, in favor for localized planetary defense and police forces. Lord Bane, now Darth Bane meanwhile, now that Khan and his Brotherhood were out of the way, instituted his own reforms to the Order of the Sith Lords, bringing about the Rule of Two, in which there would only be two Sith Lords at any given time, one master possessing all of the knowledge and power of the Sith, and one apprentice to crave it, and the cycle of the apprentice surpassing and killing their master and teaching a new apprentice would repeat until the Sith were strong enough to bring about the final destruction of the Jedi Order. It was the only way in Bane's mind to succeed. Fast forward several hundred standard years, and the rule of two is still going strong. The Mune Financier by day, Hego Damask, and Dark Lord of the Sith by night, Darth Plagueis, had just surpassed and killed his master on the world of Baldemnik, and is looking for a new apprentice, and found one in the form of an unruly human teenager from a wealthy political family on the mid-rim world of Naboo. Going only by his family name, Palpatine exuded so much power and anger in the Force that Plagueis could not ignore him, and after killing his own family in a fit of rage, he was taken under Plagueis' wing and dubbed Darth Sidious, and together they aimed to bring the Sith Master Plan to full fruition. With Plagueis' immense wealth and financial connections, and Palpatine's silver tongue and rising political career, they induced crises, secured political favors, put loyal allies at the heads of organizations, and climbed the political ladder to the highest echelons of the Republic's government. They would destroy it, and the Jedi from within. When Plagueis began his experiments to create life from nothing but the Force, he came into contact with a group of cloners from Kamino, and he was given an idea on how he could create an army to bring about the Jedi's destruction. However, his original idea was to use the Force-resistant Yinchori species as a genetic template for the clone army, but that plan was scrapped after Kaminoan geneticists assured him that the Yinchori could not be conditioned to follow orders. Another template would have to be found, but for now, efforts needed to be focused on eliminating the chances of the army being traced back to the Sith, and during a meeting on Sereno, in their guises as Senator Palpatine and Hago Damask, they met with Jedi Master Dooku and Master Sifo Dyas, who were two of the most outspoken critics of the Senate as well as their own order, and confided their displeasure with the direction that the galaxy seemed to be heading. After subsequent meetings, Plagueis managed to convince sifo of the Republic's need for rearmament, in the wake of the Naboo blockade crisis among others, and gave him a proposition. If sifo were to travel to Kamino and place an order for an army, then Damask would pay for it, footing the bill for an initial order of three million clones. sifo agreed. Shortly after Palpatine's election to Supreme Chancellor, he killed his master in his sleep, becoming the new Dark Lord of the Sith. However, his own apprentice, who he had been grooming under Plagueis' metaphorical nose, was killed by Obi-Wan Kenobi during the Battle of Naboo. He found a new apprentice in Dooku, 
the disgruntled Jedi Master had it in mind to resign from the Order, and came to his friend Palpatine for support. However, a simple meeting between friends turned into a swearing of allegiance, and Dooku emerged anew as Darth Tyrannus, with his first task of killing his friend sifo and erasing Kamino from the Jedi Archives before his formal resignation. Now that loose ends had been tied up, Tyrannus began the search for the prime template of the new clone army, and put out a contest among some of the galaxy's best bounty hunters and mercenaries to find and eliminate Kamari Vosa, Dooku's former Jedi Padawan turned crazed leader of the Bando Gora. Out of all of the contenders, only one emerged victorious, a Mandalorian by the name of Jango Fett, who had no such love for the Jedi, having survived a massacre at Galadran several years earlier after he and his men were framed in a war crime by the Death Watch, and were confronted by a cadre of Jedi, led by Dooku himself. Who better to be the template for an army designed to kill Jedi than one who had experienced fighting them? On one of the moons of Bogden, Fett was approached by Tyrannus, with an offer greater than that of the 5 million credits advertised in the contest. If he so chose, he would be the template for an army of clones, the finest army the galaxy had ever seen. And with the promise that they would be used to bring the Jedi Order to its knees, he agreed, with the condition that he could keep the first clone for himself unmodified. The terms were set, and Django traveled to Kamino to have his DNA sampled. He also handpicked 100 of the most capable individuals he knew to help train the army, a majority of which were Mandalorian like himself, and due to the secrecy of the project, they became Koi Valdar, those who no longer exist, because for the next decade they were not allowed any outside contact. The first clones to be produced were the Nulls, 12 of what were supposed to be the standard to which all the clones were to perform. However, 6 of the clones did not make it past the embryonic stage, and the other 6 remaining Nulls were so aberrant and so stubborn that they did not meet the Kaminoan standards for what the rank and file troopers were supposed to be, so they were slated for reconditioning as per their doctrine with what they viewed as a defective product. Cal Scarada, one of the training sergeants, saved the six boys from execution, and took on their training as advanced recon clone troopers along with his own training group of clone commandos. The Kaminoans would go on to correct the mistakes made with the Nulls in the subsequent batches of clones, to make them more open to taking orders and less independent than Fett as well as growth acceleration to speed up their maturation that was already successfully demonstrated within the Nulls. This development led to essentially three different classes of clone trooper, categorized by their training methods as well as genetic tampering with their temperament, and included regular clone troopers, clone commandos, and arc troopers. Standard Infantry Clone Troopers, or Rank and File Troopers, received the most genetic tampering with their temperament, and were trained in large combat groups by flash learning programs as well as class lectures and simulations. A common misconception with the standard clones is that they were simply organic droids, but while they were more receptive to orders than say the clone commandos or the ARC troopers, it did not mean that they didn't express individuality, as exemplified by their penchant for using nicknames among their brothers instead of their standard alphanumeric designations, as well as, later in the war, sporting different hairstyles and even tattoos. Alphanumeric designations for the standard troopers usually consisted of two letters followed by four or more numerals, with the prefix CT usually denoting troopers from the ranks of private to major. However, there have been instances of CL being used for lieutenants and CS being used for sergeants. Next, the clone commandos were bred for special military operations, including infiltration, extraction, sabotage, asset denial, and even assassination. And as part of that mission role, they were required to be a bit more independent, so they received more specialized training. However, they weren't too far off from standard troopers to where, later in the war, Regular troopers would be cross-trained as commandos to replenish their numbers lost from battlefield attrition. 
Unlike standard troopers, the commandos, or RCs as their designation prefix denoted, were trained in four-man teams called pods, which would eventually become their squads. And they would be assigned one training sergeant per training group, and more often than not, the commandos would look to their training sergeants as a sort of parental figure, and even take on some of their mannerisms. For example, some of the commandos that had Mandalorian training sergeants like Cal Scarada, Rav Browler, or Wallen Vau learned Mondoa as a second language, and some commandos even taught many of the standard troopers some Mandalorian war chants to sing before battle, such as Vodeon and the Da Werda Verda. They would receive a mixture of flash training as well as live fire exercises and demonstrations from their training sergeants, and commandos with different training sergeants often had different specialized skill sets, which unfortunately also meant that different training sergeants had different casualty rates among their graduates. Last but certainly not least were the ARC Troopers, the Advanced Recon Clone Troopers. These men, other than the growth acceleration built into all clones, were pure Jango Fett, and were even trained by the Prime Template himself, making them the most independent out of all of the clone troopers, which was essential for their mission role. The ARC Troopers, though sometimes operating in squads of up to ten, were more than capable of operating alone, which made them ideal for reconnoitering deep behind enemy lines and performing missions too dangerous for commandos. Only 100 ARCs were produced in total, and their alphanumeric designations started from Alpha 00 to Alpha 99. Clone commanders can also be grouped in this category, because although they weren't 100% pure Django like the Arcs, they did receive significantly more training than the standard troopers, or even the commandos, as they would need a degree of independence to make difficult tactical and strategic command decisions, sometimes without the presence of a Jedi General. However, they knew that the Jedi Generals and later the Chancellor's command always superseded theirs. The commanders were the recipients of special flash training and instruction, as well as more strategic simulations to prepare them for command, and later in the war, the ARC Lieutenant Alpha-17 would head a special ARC Trooper training program to further enhance their tactical reasoning and combat skills. Their alphanumeric designation prefix usually started with CC, though it wasn't uncommon to see CRC for clone regimental commanders and CMC for clone marshal commanders. While genetic modification to their temperament and training varied, all clones were taught one thing in common, that the Republic was the end-all be-all, the last bastion of freedom and democracy in the galaxy, and that it was their sacred duty to protect and defend the Republic and its citizens with their lives. Secondary to the Republic were the Jedi Order, and while many troopers and commanders would grow fond of their Jedi Generals as the war would eventually drag on, their loyalty to the Republic always took precedence. Part of this curriculum were the 150 Contingency Orders that would eventually be publicly outlined sometime past the Military Creation Act, and were mandatory for all clones to memorize. They covered a range of seemingly bizarre situations including if the Supreme Chancellor was deemed unfit to rule, to if the Jedi Order attempted to overthrow the Republic. Standard issue kit for the clone troops were as diversified as their training. Phase 1 clone armor was developed with input from Jango Fett, hence the iconic T-shaped visor used in Mandalorian helmet designs for thousands of years beforehand. A black body glove underneath 25 removable armor plates aided in triage, and could help stop the bleeding of an injured clone trooper. It was also temperature controlled, and advanced filters inside the helmet protected the troopers from chemical attacks and hazardous environments. To the Kaminoans who designed it, the white plastoid armor seemed far more vibrant and multicolored as they were capable of seeing in a wider spectrum than humans. However, to humans and humanoids, colored armor flashes on the Phase 1 armor denoted rank. Privates and corporals wore plain white armor with no armor flashes. Sergeants and sergeant majors sported green. Second lieutenants and lieutenants sported blue armor flashes. 
captains and majors had red, and commanders from battalion to marshal sported yellow armor flashes on their phase 1 armor. Ranks would also show up on a clone's heads-up display within their helmet to help identify officers. Later in the war, Phase 2 armor would be issued to new batches as well as active serving batches of clones, and the color code system was done away with, and instead, armor flashes would identify a clone's unit rather than a clone's rank. The 212th Attack Battalion wore orange designs on their armor, the 501st Legion famously had blue pinstriping, the 327th Star Corps wore yellow, the 187th Legion purple, the 442nd Siege Battalion had green, and the Coruscant Guard were identified by red markings, among many, many others. While Phase 2 armor was more lightweight and customizable than Phase 1 armor, it did sacrifice some of the temperature control systems, so cold assault armor had to be developed. However, the Phase 2 armor had the advantage of enhanced breathing and filtration systems in the helmet, as well as a sealable body glove and magnetized boots, so the clones could survive in vacuum, where they could not in Phase 1 armor. Weapons for the clone troopers consisted of the Blastec DC-15 series of blasters, with the choice of either the DC-15A blaster rifle or the more compact DC-15S blaster carbine. Officers would also carry the DC-17S sidearm in their holsters, but all of the blasters in Blastec's DC series of products shot ionized Tabana gas, giving the blaster bolts their distinguished blue color. They were also equipped with Mir Son thermal detonators and Blastec ECD grenades, which were capable of short-circuiting battle droids. ARC troopers wore similar kits to the standard clones, however, their armor was far more lightweight and added greater protection, and they usually wore shoulder pauldrons and commas to denote their status. Their helmet systems were also more advanced, with a mounted rangefinder offering tactical data as well as access to highly encrypted channels that were not available to the regular clones. Unlike the clone troopers, ARCs could carry into battle really whatever they wanted, as they were highly adaptable. However, their standard kit could be considered the Westar M5 blaster rifle, which had selective fire modes and could be equipped with an underslung grenade launcher, as well as more explosives and blaster packs on their bandoliers. Clone Commandos, on the other hand, had the highly advanced Katarn armor system, which featured a sealable body glove, duraplast reinforced plates capable of protecting from explosives, retractable vibro blade in the gauntlets, and advanced HUD systems within their helmet. The inside of the helmet was also totally soundproof, so Commando squads could have full conversations in private encrypted channels without the risk of the enemy hearing them. The armor was so durable that there have been occurrences of commandos throwing themselves on enemy grenades to save their comrades and walking away otherwise unscathed. Standard kit for the RCs consisted of the Blastec DC-17 interchangeable weapon system, which allowed the commando to attach and detach modules for standard CQB blasting, anti-armor launching, and sniping at long range, making the blaster versatile to any combat situation. They would also carry a host of different detonators, including thermal, sonic, and ECD, as well as the DC-15S sidearm in their holster. There were also a few less common sets of armor and kit, developed for very specific mission profiles, such as the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus or scuba trooper armor, which allowed clones trained in subsea operations to take the fight to the seps on water worlds like Mon Calamari. Blaze troopers wore heavy heat-resistant armor, with a wrist-mounted flame projector and a jetpack, equipped with an endoskeleton to help the trooper maneuver the heavy armor. There were also the clone assassins, who wore a variant of Bark Scout trooper armor, but with large retractable vibroblades on each wrist. A multitude of variants of Phase 1 and Phase 2 armor could be seen throughout the war, including clone pilots, gunners, bark trooper scouts, ATRT scouts, airborne troopers, and many, many more. Now, when it comes to how many clones were produced in total by the Camino facilities, it's a bit of a hot button issue, and it's still even to this day heavily debated among galactic historians as to how many clones there actually were. 
Official figures state that there were 3 million clones in the Grand Army of the Republic, but none of the mainstream galactic historians as well as myself believe this figure, as it's small for even a planetary scale army let alone a galactic scale one, and it doesn't even seem to take into account naval personnel as well as armored vehicle drivers, gunners, and pilots. We do know that many of the support roles within the Grand Army, including mechanics, technicians, logistics, and medical staff were occupied by non-clone volunteers and contractors, but this still doesn't make up for this horrendously low number. This is why I choose to believe that this 3 million figure represents the first initial order of clones ordered by Master sifo and that several billion more were produced on backorder in preparation for a prolonged conflict, and that the initial 3 million would suffice until the other several billion could be deployed in stages when ready. This is supported by records of planetary militia and Republic judicial forces bolstering clone ranks in the first couple months of the war, until more clone troops were ready for deployment. A substantial amount of clones were produced from facilities outside of Kamino later in the war, but I'll get to that later. The Grand Army of the Republic itself was split into two orders of battle, the regular GAR forces and the Special Operations Brigade. Starting with the GAR, the smallest unit of clones was a squad, which consisted of nine troopers led by a sergeant. Next, a platoon consisted of four squads made up of 36 troopers in total, and was led by a lieutenant. The clone troopers of a platoon were raised and trained together in what was called a birth cohort, making the unit cohesion of a platoon one of the strongest within the GAR. A company consisted of four platoons made up of 144 troopers in total, and was led by a clone captain. Battalions consisted of four companies, 576 troopers in total, and were led by a battalion commander, and in some rare cases, a major. Regiments consisted of four battalions, totaling 2,304 clone troopers, and were led by a clone regimental commander and a Jedi Padawan, who also held the title of commander. A brigade, or legion, the term was often interchangeable, consisted of four regiments, totaling 9,212 troopers, and were led by a clone senior commander and a Jedi general. A corps consisted of four brigades slash legions made up of 36,864 troopers in total, and were led by a clone marshal commander and a Jedi general. Things start to get a bit confusing once you get into the broader organizational bodies, as, in astrographical terms, a sector is made up of many star systems, and therefore bigger, yet a sector army is smaller than a systems army, which makes it seem like it should be the other way around, but it isn't. A sector army consisted of four corps, 147,456 troopers in total, led by a senior Jedi general, who sometimes also commanded one of the four corps directly as well. Later in the war, the 20 sector armies were overseen by governor generals who became moffs. And lastly, a systems army consisted of two sector armies, totaling 294,912 troops, and were led by a Jedi High General who was also a member of the Jedi High Council. Of the systems armies, there were 10 in total at the war's beginning, with the initial 3 million troops, but as I hypothesized earlier, the numbers of systems armies either expanded or the 10 grew to encompass more than two sector armies, from an influx of more clones from Kamino and other locations as the war progressed. To illustrate this organization better, let's take a look at a specific systems army and break it down from the top down, referencing the historical figures that led each unit. We start here with Systems Army Alpha, led by Jedi High General Mace Windu. Systems Army Alpha consisted of the First Sector Army, of which we do not have definitive data on, and the Second Sector Army, led by Senior Jedi General Rai Gal, and overseen by Governor General and later Moff, Fleury Voru. One of the four corps that made up the Second Sector Army was the 327th Star Corps, led by Jedi General Ayla Sakura and Clone Marshal Commander CC-5052, nicknamed Bly. 
One of the four legions within the 327th Star Corps was the 7th Legion, led by Senior Commander Aden. We do not have sufficient data on the 7th Legion's Jedi General at this time, though Sakura did lead them with the 327th Corps at the Battle of Sialakumi. Of the four regiments that made up the 7th Legion, the 101st Regiment was commanded by Jedi Padawan Commander Daniwara, and data on the 101st's regimental commander is currently unavailable. Hawkbat Battalion was one of the four battalions that made up the 101st Regiment, and it was commanded by Clone Major CT-12-12-0068. Within the Hawkbat Battalion's four companies, Bacta Company was led by Clone Captain CT-52-89-9204, nicknamed Taito. One of the four platoons making up Bacta Company was the Second Platoon, commanded by Clone Lieutenant CT-41-14-0301, nicknamed Bar. And lastly, of the four squads that made up 2nd Platoon, Talon Squad was led by Clone Sergeant CT-53-21-8778, nicknamed Green. The second order of battle was the Special Operations Brigade, with the smallest unit being a four-man commando squad, typically consisting of the squad's sergeant, a demolitions expert, a tech specialist, and a long-range specialist. Next, a troop consisted of five commando squads, totaling 20 clone commandos. A company consisted of five troops and was made up of 100 clone commandos in total. A commando group consisted of five companies, totaling 500 clone commandos, and was commanded by a junior Jedi general. Lastly, the entire Special Operations Brigade consisted of 10 commando groups, with 5,000 clone commandos in total plus the 100 Alpha class ARC Troopers and the 6 Null class ARC Troopers, and it was commanded by Jedi General Arlegan Zay. With all of these new clone troopers, the Republic would need vessels and vehicles to support and transport them to, from, and on the battlefield, but keeping an order for such a large amount of ships and combat vehicles secret presented its own challenges. Ultimately, Rothana Heavy Engineering, a subsidiary of Kua Drive Yards, was approached to produce the Grand Army's walkers, tanks, and transports, as well as new warships to bolster what would become a re-established Republic Navy. Rothana was selected due to its distance from the core, as well as its relative inaccessibility with secret hyperspace routes. This, combined with KDY's desire to keep their subsidiary off the record books for the time being, ensured its secrecy. This culminated in the ultra-secret Project Icefang, which produced a multitude of military assault vehicles including the iconic ATTE walker, the LAATI and LAATC gunships, the ATXT walker, the TX-130S fighter tank, and the SPHAT artillery walker, as well as the Acclimator class transgalactic transport and the Acclimator class assault ship, among others. After the war eventually did break out, Rothana was no longer an industry secret, and Kuat Drive Yards could directly produce vehicles and vessels for the Grand Army, resulting in a multitude of new walkers, juggernauts, transports, as well as new warships and starfighters, such as the Victory and Venator classes, as the war continued. 22 galactic standard years before the Battle of Yavin, on the red sandy plains of Geonosis, the might of the Grand Army of the Republic was witnessed for the first time, as they faced off against the combined droid armies of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. But while the clone troopers and vehicles performed to and even exceeded specifications, for the newly established Jedi Generals, the Crucible of Battle would be a learning experience, and a costly one. To no one's surprise, warrior mystics whose previous charge was the preservation of peace in the Republic did not make good first-time generals. Of the 202,000 clone troops deployed to Geonosis, a significant portion were mismanaged, as the Jedi were unaware how to properly utilize their units, and as a result, almost half of the clone commando forces deployed were slaughtered when the Jedi mistakenly used them as frontline infantry. It's been argued that the only reason why the battle was even won was because of the Separatists being caught by surprise. 
The Jedi would have to learn how to become proper generals and fast, because as soon as the Battle of Geonosis concluded, the CIS began fortifying its positions along the major trade routes, and with only one million battle-ready clone troopers for the time being, the GAR would have to rely heavily on planetary militia and Republic judicial forces to supplement it. Contrary to what one might see in the Hollow films, there were a significant portion of non-clone units that participated in the war, especially in these early months while more batches of clones were being prepared on Kamino. There have been instances of battles where not a single clone trooper fought on the Republic side, as well as rare instances of clone and non-clone units fighting side by side. Also, aside from a few clone medics trained to triage and stabilize wounded troopers, all battlefield surgeons in the GAR were non-clone volunteers and medical droids. Operating from MedStar-class frigates, they were deployed in what were called Republic Mobile Surgical Units, or RIMZUs, close behind the front lines, and were capable of picking up and moving with allied advances or retreats. This all being said, not all of the Jedi were willing to accept the charge of leading this new clone army into battle. There were Jedi that clung to the old traditions and believed that the Order should be keepers of the peace and not bringers of war and destruction. Others questioned how a mysterious army of clones came from seemingly nowhere and at a suspiciously convenient time. And yet more questioned the ethics of leading what was essentially an army of slaves to fight against a breakaway government with valid causes. One Jedi Master refused to lead clone troopers entirely. General Rom Kota agreed to participate in the war, however he did not trust the clone troopers at all and opted to raise his own militia forces to combat the Separatists, a move that would later save him from the rest of the Jedi's fate. In the civilian sector, it did not sit right at all with Senator Den Skina of Chandrilla that in a democracy like the Republic, the clone soldiers bred to protect it possessed no rights whatsoever, so he attempted to bring the issue to the attention of the Senate, as well as set up a charity fund to hopefully give clone veterans a life after the war. But to no avail. The task would fall then to Sergeant Scarada, who stayed on with the Grand Army as a military advisor, and he took it upon himself to make the lives of the clones better and prepare a future for them. He persuaded General Zay to convince the Council to give clone troopers leave when based on friendly worlds like Coruscant, and secretly worked to find a cure for the clones' accelerated aging, as well as setting up a refuge for clone veterans and deserters after the war on the planet Mandalore. Back to the war, within the first few weeks, the other two million clone troopers making up sifo original order were deployed totaling three million, making each sector army number nearly 150,000 until the back-ordered clones could be deployed. Until that time, the four cores making up each sector army were paired with a single navy assault line, which contained two acclimator-class assault ships escorted by two frigates, culminating in what would be called the 1-4-16-64 plan. In the 1-4-16-64 plan, one core acted as a mobile armored reserve, while the other three core were subdivided into highly mobile companies, capable of performing lightning raids on enemy targets or moving in to support local militia and or Republic judicial forces, while battalion and brigade level subdivisions were used to assault major targets in these early campaigns. Two months after Geonosis, the cloning facilities on Kamino themselves were attacked, and to help with the defense, the ARC troopers were released from the stasis fields they were placed in after their training with Jango concluded. The ARCs along with the Jedi turned the tide and saved the cloning facilities from falling into enemy hands. The assault on Kamino made it abundantly clear that the Republic needed to expand and decentralize its production of clones in case of another attack, and so Palpatine went behind the backs of the Kaminoan Clone Masters to work out a deal with a company called Spa'artai Creations, located on Carteo, who would in turn manufacture master-crafted cloning cylinders capable of producing fully mature clones in just one year as opposed to the Kaminoans' ten. 
In reality, this plan was to serve Palpatine's own machinations to help with the eventual overthrow of the Republic. But for now, it looked to his supporters that he was doing what he could to boost clone production for the GAR. However, the Separatists had a similar idea in using Spa'artai creations to manufacture higher quality and a greater quantity of droids, culminating in the Battle of Carteo, 12 months after Geonosis, which resulted in a Republic victory. Though Spa'artai creations was effectively destroyed during the battle, Palpatine made off with several thousands of Spa'artai cylinders already produced, and began constructing a cloning facility on Centax II, one of Coruscant's moons, and another on Wayland and later Biss, using Arcanian cloning scientists to oversee the project. These Spa'artai clones would begin deployment around the beginning of the war's third year, just in time for a new Republic offensive, designed to push the CIS out of the core, colonies, inner rim, expansion region, and mid rim to contain them in the outer rim, building up to the famed Outer Rim Sieges. Spa'artai clones bolstered the ranks of many clone units already in the field. However, the two most prominent were the Coruscant Guard, who were almost entirely Spa'artai clones, and the 501st Legion, who were partially Spa'artai clones. Not to mention, supplementing crews for the thousands of new warships that rolled off of KDY dry docks at the end of the war's second year. The Outer Rim sieges proved that the Grand Army was on the verge of victory, and with the successful defense of Coruscant as well as the death of General Grievous during the Battle of Utapau, the war seemed like it would be over in a matter of weeks, maybe even days. However, clone troopers across the galaxy were about to receive a message that would change the course of history. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, the Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Army of the Republic, issued the execution of Contingency Order Number 66. The Jedi had attempted a coup, and therefore were branded as traitors to the Republic, and as per the Contingency, were required to be removed by lethal force. It's a touchy subject that still has many beings wondering just how could these men who had served beside their Jedi Generals for so long and went through so much together just go ahead and turn on them? And I'm afraid the answer isn't easy. One must remember that these men were conditioned to serve the Republic. The Republic represented everything that they had shed blood and died for, and their Jedi officers, who they had always assumed were on their side fighting for the same cause, to their eyes, betrayed that Republic, and therefore betrayed them and their fallen brothers who fought so hard and so long. This being said, there were some clones who were initially confused by the issuance of the Order and hesitated, and even some that refused to execute it outright, such as the clone Commando Squad Ion Team during the Battle of Mercana, who let Jedi Master Roan Shrine escape with his life. But there were other clones who were more than happy to execute Order 66, such as Commander CC-1138, nicknamed Bakera, who was quoted in his memoirs saying, I hesitated for a moment when I received Order 66, because the last thing I expected was a Jedi Q. Did I feel betrayed? You bet I did. I thought of all of my men who died under Kiad even these command, and if I had known that he and his buddies were gearing up to do the Sips work for them and overthrow the government, I'd have shot him as a traitor a lot earlier. He betrayed the trust of every single one of us. In theaters across the galaxy, clone troopers shot their Jedi generals on sight. The cold determination felt by the troopers made it so that their own troops turning on them was unable to be foreseen in the Force. And back on Coruscant, the newly anointed Darth Vader led the men of the 501st Legion into the Jedi Temple, where hundreds of Jedi Knights, Masters, Padawans, and even the younglings were mercilessly gunned down in what would become known as Operation Nightfall. Not only did this heinous act culminate in revenge for the Sith Lords, but Jango received his own revenge for Galadran as well. A cruel cycle of pain and suffering had come full circle. Though Order 66 was successful in wiping out a significant portion of the Jedi and effectively destroying the Order as an organization, there were many still that managed to evade execution and scattered themselves across the galaxy. So the men of the Grand Army would have to continue to hunt down their former generals and commanders. However, they would be doing so under a new moniker. In 19 BBY, Palpatine declared himself Emperor before the entirety of the Galactic Senate, 
the Republic would be reorganized into an empire, and with it, the military institutions including the Grand Army of the Republic. The non-clones who served in the former judicial forces laid the foundation for the Imperial Army, while the clone troopers formed the backbone of the elite Stormtrooper Corps. The Stormtrooper Corps would continue to utilize FET clones for some years, until about 12 BBY, when the Kaminoans attempted to gain their independence from the Empire using their own secret clone army, which resulted in Topoka City being leveled and limited production of clones from other Kaminoan cities. Following the Kamino Uprising, clones made from other genetic templates began appearing in the Stormtrooper Corps, and even enlisted men and women were eventually allowed to join. The 501st Legion, however, retained a healthy population of FET clones within its ranks up until the Battle of Hoth in 3 ABY, and at that point, some were even old enough to have been at Geonosis. Many of the other FET clones, on the other hand, weren't as lucky as the 501st boys, and either died in battle or succumbed to their accelerated aging, and were left to rot in sanctioned vet centers when they were no longer able to serve in combat. Sadly, with many being biologically in their 70s and 80s, while only being in their 40s in chronological years. This ends my findings on the Grand Army of the Republic. If you have any suggestions for future transmissions, don't be afraid to drop a comment. If you'd like to support this channel, consider visiting my new Patreon to find out how. Link is in the description. In the meantime, keep your comm channels open for future transmissions, and don't forget to subscribe. Tad Larkin, out.